So here's the concept. <laughs> I guess the colors is like, whoa. <laughs> every impedance with the label Z, every impedance has two pieces, a resistance, call it R, and a reactance, we'll call it X. Resistance, well, that makes sense, R. Reactance, uh, well, I don't know, X. <laughs> impedance, Z. They're just letters. Every antenna has some impedance. Even zero is a number, right? So is that concept okay? Every antenna, no matter where I use it, will have some resistance, some reactance, some impedance. Can my nano VNA measure all three of these? Yes! <laughs> or I wouldn't waste my time talking about this stuff, right? Now some antenna analyzers will tell you how good it is SWR, but it won't tell you all this information. Now maybe this is more information than you need or would like. I would say probably, but we're going to dive in anyway. All right, so every impedance on an antenna has a unique location, an R and an X. We often write it this way, the resistance first part, R, ideally 50, but any number, R, plus or minus JX. The J, don't worry about that. J just means it's the reactance part. The J itself is just a letter to indicate it's not a resistance. So here's some samples. All right, here's something important. Think of this like a target and you're shooting arrows. Where do you want to aim? I want to aim in the bullseye. You know, I get more points if I'm in the bullseye. The bullseye is our goal on the Smith chart, and I'm going to force the bullseye to be 50 ohms. That's coming. Does everyone get the concept? So far, what I've said, I don't have to prove other than the fact that how did I get 50 ohms to be the bullseye? I, I didn't share that yet. 50 ohms is where I want to be. Why? Because my coax is 50 ohms. I didn't make the coax. Who made the coax? I don't know. Why did they make it 50? Why not 30 or 80? There actually is coax of different impedance values. But kind of the standard size, uh, we standard on 50 ohms coax, like, you know, in the 1950s or earlier. All right. So we'll get back to the nano VNA. So the nano VNA, unlike a lot of these little MFJ antenna analyzers and rig experts, antenna analyzers, you need to calibrate this. Calibrate. I sort of mentioned that in the talk last summer, but I didn't go into gory detail. So how do you calibrate your nano VNA? Well, if they have these SMA connectors, and many of them do, you have one connector you can plug into the end, and it just has the letter O. O stands for open. Open meaning there's no connection between the pin and the shield. It's open. Well, there's air in there, but, you know, an infinite resistance here. Another connector you can screw on, S, stands for a short. That just means there's a little wire connecting the pin and the shield. A short circuit, zero ohms, essentially. And then here's the key. Without this, it wouldn't work. You have a third connector you can screw in called a load. Load. Well, we've used that term in ham radio uh, applications. A load is something that can absorb power, a load. Uh, it could be your antenna. It could be a light bulb, you know, anything, a load. Inside this is a calibrated 50 ohm resistance with no reactance. So that's the expensive part, a 50 ohm non-inductive resistor. And it connects the pin to the shield. Okay? So I have to calibrate my nano VNA. I can do it right on the nano VNA itself. I don't need the computer software. But boy, the computer software made it a whole lot easier. I go to my nano VNA saver and click calibrate. I want to calibrate it. Uh, maybe I plugged in it for the first time, and I have these three little standards. So it guides me in sort of a little, uh, you know, page by page how to do that. And there's something here that really helped me called Calibration Assistant. <laughs> you know, Windows, I like these things, assistance. Something or someone's going to help me. Sometimes their voice, you know, activated. So I say, yeah. And it shows me a little instruction sheet and says, all right, Teacher Barry, plug the zero ohm into the end of the VNA. The zero ohm, that's the uh, the short. Plug the short, load, and I do that, and I click OK, and it pops up this graph. It says, oh, good. So on the Smith chart, your zero ohm, no reactance is going to plot right here. I'm thinking, 
All right, I'm one for three. That's good. <laughs> that was easy. No pain except I screwed it in carefully. Oh, and it says, don't screw it in too tight and break the threads. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. The instructions really said that. Be careful when you screw it in. All right, so I've got one. Then it gives me instructions. It says, okay, Teacher Barry, plug in the O for open. So I unscrew. It should have said unscrew the other one and screw this one. In. I do that, and I click OK, and it plots over here. In other words, it's figuring out where to plot these points on the Smith chart. Very clever. I mean, that's probably hundreds of lines of programming right there. So the infinite resistance, the open plots here. OK, so far? So how many points do I have on my Smith chart that the software knows? Two. Two. Zero ohms infinite and so far no reactants right so what's it going to ask me next all right teacher barry pick your load what do you want to pick and i say i'm going to pick the default loan you already sold it to me it says good <laughs> plug in the load and i plug that in and it says on it 50 ohms right and i click okay and it plots it here how did it know how to do that well i'm not going to go into that that's another hour lecture but i mean th this is a lot the software learned uh, from the 50 ohm standard where to plot it. It's called normalizing. That means it's kind of complicated, right? The center of the Smith chart, I can make any value I want if I have the standard. And I only had the one standard called 50 ohms. Okay, so far? How many yeah. points do I now know? Three. Zero ohms, infinite ohms, and 50 ohms. And 50 ohms plots dead center. I've defined the bullseye on this Smith chart, not every Smith chart, this one. We good so far? <laughs> yep. See, if I lose you at step 12, I don't want to be talking step 22 here. So call out, unmute. I haven't plotted anything in, in inductance yet. Okay, now, how does it know how to do this? <laughs> Obviously, the software is the key. And a lot of the software is written in complex language that, you know, we mortals don't speak. But with a lot of careful, you know, trials and errors, uh, the manufacturers of the hardware get some very clever engineers, software engineers, to write instructions and make it easier for us to use. So Nano VNA Saver is just it's so well written. And it's, did I say, it's free. <laughs> I mean, you can give them donations and nice letters. Thank yous. Okay, so in the nano VNA, I showed you this slide before. I don't want to talk about this. An engineer would talk an hour about this. In the nano VNA, there's a source. That means a little transmitter. Sends a signal out on the uh, port. That signal can go to a device under test, a DUT. <laughs> Engineers like that. Eh? Now, in the case of an antenna, there's no output. I mean, the output's an EM wave. So in the case of an antenna, if the energy goes to the antenna, Either it's radiated or some of it comes back in the coax, you know, like an SWR other than one to one. What comes back can be analyzed as a reverse signal, reverse voltage, analyzed compared to the input, and you can get all sorts of information. I would say this is sort of like a dolphin in the ocean goes tweak and listens for an echo. And it goes tweak and it hears tweak and it can see, see and hear what's around it. That's what we're doing for the antenna. We're sending a RF signal on a piece of coax to an antenna, and by seeing what comes back, I don't mean seeing literally, measuring what comes back, we can sort of tell how well the antenna is behaving at that frequency. What if nothing comes back? Well, that's ideal. I want all the energy to go on the antenna and radiate. Even if someone said, well, Barry, what if my antenna is disconnected? I said, try it. Try it. Take your antenna and disconnect the coax. Go to your shack, turn on your transmitter, send it 100 watts if you can, see what happens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so Try. what's going to happen? Good, a good Try rig times. should do what? A good rig should do what? <laughs> Shut down. Shut down. Because the new rig <laughs> sends the SWR, and if the SWR is too high, the rig says, no way, Teacher Barry. And, it, you know, and in fact, the Kenwood rigs I thought were so cool. If I transmitted it into the wrong antenna, I'd hear in CW what? Did it da 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 SWR SWR you know 20 words a minute in CW it was telling me the SWR is no good teacher Barry you better fix this now you know in some of the older rigs you might burn them up so you don't really do that but so if the antenna is working perfectly you know the SWR is one to one nothing comes back 
Now, what if I put this into a filter or something? Something can go through the filter. So with the nano VNA, as you get better with it or more experience, you can start to measure the through signal. So I started to look at coils, capacitors, circuits, all kinds of things that I had in my closet I wanted to figure out. So that's as much as I want to say here. The innards of this are very complicated electronics, but it's you know still 100 bucks worth of parts. All right, we have to define a couple of terms because now we're getting to 11th grade uh, math here. A term that you've probably never heard, never used, never needed as a ham radio operator, reflection coefficient. It's a buzzword. Engineers use this all the time. Hams probably have never heard this. Reflection coefficient. It's just a ratio. It's a number. It's between 0 and 1. So it's not hard to figure this stuff out. It's the voltage reflected, if there is one, divided by the voltage forward. The voltage forward is made by the nano VNA. You send that out when you say to the nano VNA, ping. What if this number and this number are the same? What if it's 1 over 1? Then you got 1. What if it's 0? There's nothing reflected. What's zero divided by anything? Zero. So zero means there's no energy reflected back to the nano VNA. No energy back. That first sounds bad, right? No, you know, I don't want any energy coming back. I want it all radiated. So that uh, row is zero means my antenna is perfect. There's nothing coming back. Row is one. It means the antenna is as bad as it could possibly be. I send one watt to the antenna. One bot comes back to me. It's like, no, 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 no. That's... Nothing's radiating. So a row of zero is desirable. A row of one is, <laughs> can't get any worse than that. So remember, the reflection coefficient, the Greek letter rho, is just a pure number. It's a ratio. Someone said, what are the units? Is it volts or ohms? I said, look, it's volts over volts. What's volts over volts? Zero. There's no unit. Rho does not have units. And someone said, I don't get it. I said, all right, all right. What are the units for pi? And they thought, uh, it has no units. It's you know, circumference divided by a diameter. It's, like, it's the same thing. Rho is volts over volts. That The volts cancel. It's just a pure number. Okay, return loss. Engineers use this all the time. Hams never talk about return loss. It's related to SWR and more, what's the word, more refined than SWR. Return loss is a number but it's in decibels. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, Teacher Barry. What is the business of decibels? Decibels is just a way to compare two numbers as a ratio with a logarithm. <laughs> now you're talking about logs, Teacher Barry. Back off. Logs is just a way to compress a big scale into a small scale. You're looking at powers of 10. So the return loss is by formula, negative 20 times the log of rho. What's rho? Remember, rho is 0 to 1. But if you remember Algebra 2, or if you have a calculator, the log of a number from 0 to 1 is itself a negative number. So a negative number times a negative number, so return loss is a positive number. Here's where a lot of hams make the mistake. They call return loss negative 10 dB. Uh, the best example I could say is this. What if I say to you, I'm on a diet and I lost negative 10 pounds. What does that mean? I lost negative 10 pounds. I take that as mean, I gained 10 pounds. Uh, that didn't help. No, you'd say, I'm on a diet, I lost 10 pounds. So return loss, I can say the return loss, as the signal came back, the return signal, it lost 10 dB, 20 dB, 50 dB. I want that to be a big number, a big number, return loss. I don't want anything to come back. But something's going to come back if the SWR isn't perfect. So how does this relate to the more common expression in ham lango language, SWR? So SWR really is computed from this. SWR is 1 plus the reflection coefficient, 1 plus rho, divided by 1 minus rho. That's how SWR is defined. We usually define it, but it's not measured this way, as the maximum voltage to the minimum voltage on a piece of coax. But that's not how we actually measure it instrumentally. So what happens when rho is 0? All right, I can do this in my head. 1 plus 0, that's 1. 1 divided by 0. Well, that's 1. What's 1 over 1? Well, that's 1. So when rho is 0, the SWR is 1, I'm happy. That's the perfect antenna. If, my, if I say my SWR is 1 to 1 on my dipole, like everyone knows, I'm not going to get any better than that. What if the rho is 1? 
One plus one. I can do that in my head. One plus one. That's two. What's one minus one? Uh, no, wait a minute. I'm in trouble. That's zero in the denominator. You can't do that, teacher Barry. Algebra, uh, you can't divide by zero. So that means the, infi uh, the SWR is like infinitely bad. So return loss is something that nano VNA can measure directly. And if you want, you can convert to SWR or ask the nano VNA to convert it to SWR. We can do that just with a click of a mouse. So just a little chart to go back and forth. If my reflection coefficient is zero, that's where I want, my return loss is, now here you gotta be careful. It's infinite, nothing's coming back. I have an infinite loss. It's like saying, I'm on a diet, I lost 120 pounds, you know, I weigh zero. Well, that wouldn't be good for me, but I mean, for an antenna, that would be good. Big loss, I don't want, you know, the calculated SWRB1, so this is like the perfect antenna. But often my antennas say, the SWR is two to one, and my radio works. I work the world on a two to one SWR. What's coming back is about 10 dB. I'm thinking, oh, what does that mean? Oh, that means the return energy is about 30% of what I sent. I send one volt, 0.3 volts comes back. I get a little bit of that. My radio works fine. It's not perfect antenna. Do I need a perfect antenna? No, <laughs> I don't need a, per especially on 80 meters. So, you know, when am I gonna worry about my loss? Well, if my S meter goes down one, u one unit, if I'm talking to somebody who says, you're S8, uh, now you're S7, I'm thinking, oh, I must have lost a lot there. I can still talk to them, but a little noisier. So when your loss is about one S unit, then it becomes, you know, pretty convincing. So the return loss, you know, SWR, SWR3 is still, I've lost half my power, but the other guy's S meter only went down half an S unit. It's like someone didn't believe me. They said, Teacher Barry, that's impossible. I said, no, work it out. An SWR of three to one means you've lost half the voltage. This is a voltage measurement. And power is V squared over R. So half the voltage is 0.5 squared a quarter, 25%. 25%. The other guy's not going to notice that or just barely here. You'll sound a little weaker. So my antennas would work fine with an SWR three to one, as long as the radio can deliver power to it. Now, granted, some radios start to balk when the SWR is three to one. Okay, so far. All right, so I don't want to talk about this, but just show it uh, on the internet. This company, Agilent, they're superb. They make, they make great slides. I couldn't make this slide. So this shows how the three are related. Reflection coefficient, it's a ratio of voltages. It's actually, as an engineer would say, a ratio of impedances. But that gets into complex numbers, and I don't want to go there. Return loss, negative 20 times the log of rho. Or an engineer would say the rho is the absolute value of gamma, and gamma is a complex number. We're not going to go there. The important thing is this little chart here, or this little graph. When rho is 0, the SWR is 1, the return loss is infinite. I want my antenna to be here. ZL equals Z0. Fancy way of saying impedance of the load, the antenna, is the impedance of coax, 50 ohms, ideal. This would be awful over here, a row of one. Everything's coming back. The SWR is infinitely high. Return loss, nothing. I don't want to be here. So I thought, oh, it's a very nice slide, but it's maybe oversharing. So let's take a look at some of my antennas here, and then we'll come back to taking a look to the in, in interpreting the Smith chart. So I have a 50-foot vertical. I, I mean, I build it. It's just aluminum tubing, real cheap stuff. It's literally lashed to a fir tree that's about 80 feet tall. I've got a loading coil at the base, so I can tune it to about 3.7 megahertz, the be, you know, the middle of the band. I put on two 65-foot radial wires. These are about 10 feet above the ground, so my lawnmower doesn't run over them. It's pretty simple antenna, not anything exotic. It's kind of a you know, just hunk of wire in a tree. I feed it with 150 feet of good quality RG213. 150 feet. That's about 150 bucks here. This is about, you know, $20 of antenna, $150 of coax. Here's what it looks like on my nano VNA. Here's, here's the reflection coefficient, S11, reflection coefficient. It's very low, 0.29. Well, remember, it's 0 to 1. 1 would be absolutely bad. 0 is perfect. So it's pretty low. It's below about 0.3 until I get to the top of the band. Reflection coefficient, 0 to 1, pretty good. 
Here's the return loss. Oh, wait a minute, this is getting huge. Now I'm plotting it here for my convenience as a negative number because I want it to have this shape. But a lot of RF engineers would look at this and say, Teacher Barry, you know, grow up. Plot it the way it's supposed to be, a positive return loss. But I want it to be this shape, <laughs> so I, I plot it as negative. Anyway, what's it doing? It has a big dip here. Why does it have a big dip here? Because the SWR is the lowest there. If the return loss is big, and it is here, a negative number big, that means the antenna is going to work better. And look, the reflection coefficient is low where the return loss is high. Does that make sense? I had to think about that for a while. Here's the graph that everyone says, oh, now I get it. Look, the SWR is lowest right here where the return loss is highest. So what is this? Way up at the top, the SWR is 2 to 1. Well, I could live with that. My radio is happy. So if I look at this antenna and tell you, this antenna as is, as I'm feeding it in my shack with 150 feet of good quality coax, this should probably work reasonably well over the entire 80 meter band. True or false? True or false? Charlie's nodding. <laughs> Charlie's my student in the front of the class that's willing to answer. Thank you, Charlie. Okay. Yeah, I'd say this looks pretty good. This is really good, in fact. How come the SWR isn't going, you know, weird at the ends? Because it's two-inch thick aluminum tubing. It's, got a, it's a real thick wire, right? All right, so that's looking pretty good. This is my antenna, cheaply made. Here's the same antenna and the impedance graph. I'm looking from here, from the bottom of the 80-meter band to the top. Hey, teacher Barry, the impedance isn't 50 ohms constant. No, look, it's varying. Why is the impedance varying? Well, that's a good question. It's not resonant everywhere. So at some points, the impedance is above 50. At some, it's below 50. And it's, it's doing kind of a funny sine wave here. Also, there's a lot of other wire in my backyard that this is interacting with. But it's basically from 40 to 60 ohms. Mm, coax will work reasonably well into a 40 ohm or a 60 ohm. It's not perfect. I don't need it to be perfect. Okay, so far. Okay. Smith chart. We're, we're back to the Smith chart. Now, I told you something. I said when I made the Smith chart graph and calibrated it, what did I put in the center? What's the center? The center is 50 ohms. Why? Because I made it 50 ohms. Because I used their little 50 ohm center uh, standard. So look at this. Where is the, so there's no numbers here. I didn't need it. The bullseye is ideal. Number three, number three is closest to the bullseye. Not quite touching it. Number three is close to, oh, look, 50 ohms. Number three, oh, that's where the SWR is low. It's like 1.05 to 1. Not going to get any better than that. 1, 3, oh, that's where the return loss is great. They all connect. The reflection coefficient is lowest in the middle of the band, 3,700. The return loss is greatest. The SWR is lowest. The impedance is about 50 ohms, where I want it, position 3. What about position 1? Well, it's off the center. It's not too close to the bullseye. But then again, it's not too far. Here's a little circle here, and it says 2.0. Anything in this circle, inside the circle, would have an SWR of 2 to 1. So most of my antenna, in blue here, most of my antenna would have an SWR less than 2 to 1. Hi, my radio's happy. I'm happy. I can work the world with that. The Smith chart tells me everything, everything. So why do antennas have reactants? Because they're not the right length. How is it measured? Ohms. How is it corrected? Oh, I didn't tell you that yet, did I? So now let's look at a typical horizontal dipole that's a half length long fed with 50 ohm coax. So I'm going to jump to another antenna in my backyard. So here it is. So it looks like the standard dipole fed with coax. It may or may not have a balance here, but that's not going to affect what I'm going to tell you. There's one or more resonant frequencies of this antenna, but I build it for 80 meters, so I think it's about 130 feet long end to end. And it's up in a tree somewhere. Okay? Below resonance, below resonance, 3,500, 3,600, the dipole's too short. It means the current at the feed point here, the current, gets ahead of the driving voltage. What does that mean? It means it's starting to behave like a capacitor behaves in an AC circuit. 
But what if I go to the top of the band, 3900, 3950? Now I'm above the resonant frequency. Remember, the resonant frequency is about 3700. The dipole's too long. Oh, I know how I could fix it. I go up and cut 10 feet off the antenna. No, I'm not going to do that because then the antenna's too short for all the other bands. You know, no, I don't want to cut the wire. But now the current's getting ahead of the voltage. What does that mean? It means the antenna is behaving more the way inductors behave. So there was a little slang expression we had to memorize. <laughs> you don't have to understand it, just memorize it. Eli the Iceman. Remember that? <laughs> if you took an advanced class test, I had to remember. Eli the Iceman. L is inductance. So in an inductive circuit, E, that's the voltage, the EMF. The voltage is ahead of the current. In a C, in a capacitor, the current, I, is ahead of the voltage. I didn't have to tell you why that's true. I just had to know it was true. So if you want to know why these are true, that's another hour talk, and that'd be, that would be fun, but that's not for today. So here's another antenna, a horizontal antenna. It's also about 135 feet. It's in a tree. And I'm just going to say, where is the resonant frequency? What does resonant mean? Now stop. Think. What is resonance? Resonance means, Charlie said it, no reactance. No reactants. Where in this chart is there no reactants? Remember I told you that in the beginning? Around two. The horizontal, the Around horizontal two. axis. Yeah, Charlie, thank you. The horizontal axis is any point on the horizontal axis will have some resistance and no reactants. So Charlie just piped out point two. Point two is at 3,600. Yeah, that's where I made the antenna because that's where my favorite part of the band is. Charlie, tell me about point three, though. What's the reactance of point three? It's higher than that, that's for sure. What's the reactance, Charlie? No. Oh, it's well, resistance uh, is still zero. It's uh, zero. <laughs> you yeah, got it. Yeah, right. yeah, so zero I picked on Charlie. Charlie, was, uh, Charlie apologized for picking on you. Okay, so any point, any point on the horizontal lactance has a reactance of zero but over on the left the resistance is zero in the middle the resistance is 50 and on the far right the resistance is infinity so point three is not in the bullseye but it's along the horizontal axis so what's happening at point three point three is 30 uh point three is 3700 oh so the antenna has the it's closest to the bullseye at point two 3600 but at point three uh at point three 3700 watch how i Watch how I phrase this. At point three, 3,700 kilohertz, 3.7 megahertz, is the reactant zero? That's a yes or a no. The answer the is, is zero. yes. Reactance is zero because there, there's a there's a. There that's my next question, higher. Charlie. Wait, wait. That's my next question. <laughs> Charlie's a good student. He's always thinking ahead of the teacher. But the resistance is not 50 ohms. Well, what is the resistance? Well, I don't have numbers, but what if I just say here, at position three, let's say the resistance is 400 ohms. But I'm feeding with 50 ohm coax. 400 ohms, 50 ohms. Can you look at that and make an estimate? What's the SWR? 400 to 50. That's 8 to 1, isn't it? The SWR would be awful. 8 to 1. My antenna would balk at that. But be careful, it's resonant at three as well. It does not have any reactance. But the resistance isn't close to 50 ohms, so it's not going to work well. The impedance is not 50 ohms for sure. Okay? So what happens at point four, five, six? Well, it's just getting worse and worse. The worse the antenna behaves, the farther it is from the bullseye. Let me stop. That's the key to this whole talk. On a Smith chart, how far I am from the bullseye will tell me right away what the SWR is. It'll tell me if the resistance is too low or too high, left or right, and it'll tell me if the reactance is positive or negative, capacitive or indu inductive or capacitive. Class. Where do I want to be on my antenna? Class. The bullseye. Why? Because I calibrate it there to be 50 ohms resistance, zero reactance. Let me stop. That's the key. Did I lose half of you? See, I can't tell. In a live class, I look around the room to see if people have fallen asleep or like, what? I lost this slide four, teacher. Here's the key. 
the Smith chart, even without numbers here, I know I want to be in the bullseye because that's what I calibrated 50 ohms. If my intent is anywhere close to the bullseye, I'll probably get it to work well with 50 ohm coax. I keep saying that. If I use ladder line or some other feed line, this doesn't tell me anything. All right, so my antenna is all set, and it'll work well at 3600 because that's the way I build it. Now, I hear some activity on the phone part of the band, and I want a QSY up there. 3900, wait a minute, that's up here. The top of the band, that's not close to the bullseye. Here's my SWR, 3 to 1. Ah, I don't like that. My radio doesn't like that. What can I do? What can I do? I'm in my shack. It's a nice day. I know what I can do. I can climb the tree and shorten my antenna, and, you know. And then put it back up. I'm not going to do that. What can I do from my shack to make my radio work better at the top of the 80 meter band with this antenna? Use a Some tuner. Use a yeah, tuner. Yeah. So someone said, well, why don't you put up another 80 meter dipole and cut it for the phone part of the band? Actually, I did. <laughs> but I wouldn't have to. So Charlie said, use a tuner. So uh, let's think about this for a minute. A tuner. An antenna tuner. Well, I... I see those advertised all the time. So we're going to take a quick look at antenna tuners if I have time. A tuner. Uh, well, here's an, a sample tuner. Now, I, I don't need this tuner. This looks pretty intimidating. Um, so what's inside a tuner? Uh, they can be just passive parts, coils and capacitors. This one, though, looks like, you know, it's a pretty beefy one. It can handle, you know, two kilowatts or something. At the end of my feed line, in my shack, where I'm plugging this into the Nano VNA, the antenna is telling me an R and an X. Can this gadget convert the R, whatever it is, to 50 ohms? And it can, el can it eliminate the X? I want it, this tuner to eliminate the reactants. Now where? In my shack. I can't eliminate the reactants up at the antenna unless I put this gadget up at the antenna. I'm not going to do that. I'd have to waterproof it and everything. So let's see if we can figure out how this gadget can work. The antenna tuner, I'm assuming it's in your shack. Now, granted, there are some antenna tuners. They're automatic, and you mount them up at your antenna. Uh, that's not one of these things. The antenna tuner is going to re-reflect the wave coming back from the antenna into your shack. Re-reflect it. That sounds like magic, Teacher Barry. The transmitter is going to see only a 50 ohm load, and it's going to see an SWR of 1 to 1. That's what I want to happen. And if that happens, if that happens, if I can get my tuner set up properly, the antenna tuner, passive device, coils and capacitors, the antenna tuner provides a, now watch out, a reflection gain. Oh, I like the word gain. I'm getting something, right? What am I getting? It might be that 100 watts goes out of the transmitter, gets to the antenna, and let's say 25 watts comes back from the antenna, back into my shack. Can this tuner take the 25 watts coming the wrong way, turn it around, and now 125 watts is going to the antenna? Can my antenna tuner do that? Yes, no, don't know, don't care. Can an antenna tuner take the power coming back from my antenna and turn it around and send it right back to the antenna? So now there's more power going to the antenna than coming out of the radio. Is that possible? No. no. The answer is yes. Okay, yes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, Charlie. <laughs> okay. Um, it's kind of interesting. I'm not saying 125 watts will now radiate from the antenna. I'm not making the antenna any better, Charlie. It's still got a lousy SWR, 3 to 1. But the power that comes back that's reflected, my antenna tuner will re-reflect it back in the direction of the antenna. There's more power going towards the antenna than comes out of the transmitter. Now, if my feed line were absolutely zero loss, it can't be, but if it were zero loss transmission line, I'd actually have 125 watts eliminating going out of the antenna. That never happens. So I'm always going to lose some power in this feed line, whether it's coax or whatever. So here's what I wanted to do. Here's my Smith chart. I just showed you this. Here's my actual 80 meter inverted V dipole. Here it is. I'm going to attach the feed line into this antenna tuner, twist the dials, 
And now I get this modified Smith chart. How did it do that? Well, that involves a lot of complex mathematics. But what it did was change the resistance at 3.9 megahertz back to 50 ohms, or pretty close to it. So my radio sees an SWR of 1 to 1 at marker 5. What's marker 5? Oh, up in the phone band, 3.9. Because I want to use this radio now at the phone band. However, I've sacrificed something. The bottom of the band would be a horrendously bad SWR. So I had to adjust my antenna tuner, those three knobs, so that the antenna tuner made my radio happy at 3.9 megahertz. But if I now go back to the, phone, to the CW part of the band, I'd have to redo my antenna tuner or this won't work. So you pay a price if it's a manual tuner. You've got to tune it up for whatever frequency you're on. So here's my 80 meter antenna, but now in my shack, adjusted by my antenna tuner, which is, it looks sort of like the one I showed you. Here's the modified Smith chart. Oh, that's weird. It's very different from the original. Here's the reflection coefficient. That's called S11 for engineers. Reflection coefficient. Oh, it's really low. Yeah, look, it's low at 3,900. Well, that's where I want to operate. Let's look at the return loss. Oh, man, it's huge. Well, it's a negative number, but don't worry about that. It's huge at 3,900. Yeah, that's good. A big loss is good, remember? Here's the, remember, the blue is the resistance. Oh, it's lousy here, but oh, look, it's 50 ohms. That's good at about 3,900. The red's the reactants. In ohms, it's what? It's zero. No reactants here. Well, that's good. I haven't talked about phase. Let me skip this for a minute. Here's the SWR. Oh, awful. 13 to 1. Like, yikes. But, oh, it's real good down here. 1 to 1 at 3,900. So by me fiddling with these dials on the uh, antenna tuner, what have I done? I retuned my antenna system, the whole thing, including the feed line, to, to be really low resistance, 50 ohms, no reactants, zero, Big return loss at 3,900 kilohertz. If I QSY off that, this isn't going to work very well. So I've manually tuned my tuner to work really well in the phone part of the band. Phase. You know, if I have to look at one graph, this tells me everything as well. Phase tells me whether I'm inductive or capacitive reactants, or if there's any reactants at all. But phase isn't in ohms. Phase is as an angle measurement. That gets a little confusing, but... If the reactance is zero, the phase angle is zero. Zero is good. Zero ohms and zero degrees. So look at this. The phase would be zero right about in here, 34 and negative 34. So where's the phase zero? Oh, look, there's a big slice here, right about 3,900. So the phase is changing direction. Do you see that here? An engineer would look at this and say, oh, I can tell you everything about the antenna right here. It's capacitive or it's inductive reactive, except for right here where the reactance is zero and the phase is zero. So this antenna has been retuned to 3,900 kilohertz. I better stop because I'll get too excited and get, <laughs> get way off point here. I've thrown a lot of material at you. The last time I gave this, someone had a really, really good question. I said, oh, man, I, that's so good. He said, does my antenna have to be resonant for me to work out country you know all the countries in the world I said actually no I'm, I'm pushing this idea of resonance reactance of zero resistance 50 ohms because that's the ideal if I feed my antenna with coax I've got to be a little careful because coax can be very lossy with a high SWR what if I put my dipole up in the tree and feed it with ladder line window line something that's not coax and that ladder line comes to my tuner then I could tune my whole antenna to any frequency from 80 meters to 10 meters reasonably well with not much loss inside the tuner. There's always loss in a tuner. So the answer is no. My antenna does not itself have to be resonant. I like to pick 80 meters because it's so wide a band that if you tune it to one part of the band, it doesn't work well at the other ends of the band. So let me stop because it's already 1130. I've probably gone over my fair share of the time, and I tried to cover probably too much material, but let me stop and ask 
You see, my nano VNA didn't fix my antenna. My antenna tuner fixed my antenna. But my nano VNA sort of told me what my tuner has to do to make my system work well. Did I need the nano VNA to fix it? No, I could have used any old SWR measurement. Did I make the SWR in my tuner better for the radio? Absolutely, yes. But here's the tricky question. Did my antenna tuner change the SWR up at my actual antenna? Yes or no? Yeah, that's a good question to end this on. That, that's your quiz. Did my antenna tuner in the shack improve the SWR at my antenna? Yes or no? No. No. Absolutely no. <laughs> so why did I need it? I needed it, what? To make my radio happy. My radio wants to deliver 100 watts into a load, and it likes to see a load of 50 ohms. Why? Because the manufacturer built it that way. So my antenna tuner is making the whole system non-reactive. Although the antenna itself has reactants, what's the antenna tuner really doing? You might look at it this way. It's canceling the reactants at the antenna in my shack. If you see it that way, you really see a more deeper understanding of this. The R plus JX up at my antenna sees R minus JX in the tuner, and that's how the tuner re-reflects the wave right back up to the antenna. So these antenna tuners are kind of magic in a way. Now an engineer would say, no, it's no big deal. You know, the impedance here matches the impedance there. It's no big deal. But for, you know, most mortals, when we look at this reactance, re, you know, all, all these fancy terms, you can get lost. But the Smith chart tells you everything. Everything. Questions, comments. Think I get another cup of coffee. <laughs> Hi, this is W2AB is your PowerPoint presentation going to be available? I can send it to you as a PDF slide. Yeah, sure. Let me see how far I got. I, I got through about half the screens. I, I mean, as a, like a teacher, I, I you know, oh, this would be interesting. So I end up like with 100 slides, and I'm only going to show you, you know, 30 of them or something. I wanted to think about going more into detail of in the tuner what's happening. And I thought, no, that's digging too deep into the weeds. I, you know, like, yes, I can send you uh, the PowerPoint. Yeah. No, I'll send it to Tom and uh, Namar, and they can put it out however they do. It'd be easier if I sent it to them as a PDF slide. Thank you. We could add it to the group's I.O. page with the files and documents. Not a problem. See, for Please my, the slides just allow me to talk. Barry, you had a great presentation. I like the way you presented that the, going from the Y plot to come up with the Smith chart. That's very unique. That really explains a lot. You know, Teaching look, math to ninth graders. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that's great. Uh, Barry? Want to add that Tom is sending his kudos to you. Okay. He said he wrote something very complex down to simple practical terms. That was way at sex. We say hi to as well, Tom. And that was his comment. And and definitely Barry, I've been seeing these Smith charts all my ten radio life and I think it's the first time I truly understand them. So thanks for <laughs> down meat and potatoes or like the movie would say, tell it to me like I'm a for you. So it was great, and, and we really appreciate it. Does anybody have any additional questions, comments about this presentation we had today with Ben? Yeah, this is in 2 a.m. Go for it, Dave. Good morning. Okay, good morning, everybody. And Barry, uh, uh, you've done a great job with this. I, I'm kind of a conceptual thinker. Um, it, it's so great to see you do with the lecture, not super math-heavy, and conceptual because that I was able to grasp a lot more than if you did a straight boring recitation of numbers. So you really meshed with my mental view of stuff as a conceptual thinker. Kudos. Thank you. Did you ever build an antenna and try to measure anything about it? There's diplexers. You can use it for all kinds of things, but I think it's being advertised as kind of a inexpensive but very effective antenna analyzer. It's far more than that. Yeah, well, I've uh, I, I've put up antennas and, and various things, but I've never really did the tricky part of measuring and so on like that. But I understand it theoretically, of course. Yeah, well, I've uh, I, I've put up antennas and, and various things, but I've never really 
did the tricky part of measuring and so on like that, but I understand it theoretically, of course. Well, there, you know, there's, there's different levels of understanding. I, there's a phrase I remember. There's knowing. I can know stuff and pass tests. When I was 13 years old, I passed the novice, the tech, the general, advanced. I didn't understand anything. I memorized, draw a circle, put dots, it said, draw a circuit of a, a Coppets oscillator with a blah, 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 and I, I, and I knew how to do it. You draw a circle, you put, if someone had said, what's in the circle, I'd say, I don't know, I just draw a circle with dots, I don't know what any of this means. So I passed all these tests, I got all these licenses, I was 14 years old, without knowing anything. Now, over the next 20 years, I started to learn you know, Ohm's Law and this and this and that, you know. So, you know, I, being a physics teacher and professor for 40, 50 years, I had to delve into, what's this really mean? If I were to ask a hams, and, you know, like, like this, why does an antenna have reactants? Often there's just the silence. And that's why I wanted to start out that way, because fundamentally, antennas have resistance and reactants, and the reactants may or may not be zero. When there's zero, something magic happens, only a pure resistance. And that that's easy to match and feed to like feed lines and stuff. But as an antenna has more and more reactants, it's behaving weirdly for, you know, a coax to feed energy to it. Yeah, See, like a capacitor, a capacitor takes in energy and gives it right back to you. A capacitor is not a load. It can't radiate. A resistor is a load. So what do you want your antenna to really do? Radiate an electromagnetic wave. Could it do that if the antenna had zero resistance? No. <laughs> Could it do it if the antenna had an infinite resistance? No. Barry? <laughs> yes. Barry? Hi, this is Judith, KC2LTM. Will you Hi, good morning. Planning? Good morning. Are you planning on coming back with a part three? I have, I have no idea. <laughs> well, um, Barry, your email address, okay, for anyone who has any questions post the session.